It's okay not to be okay, but I promise I'm trying. By Ray Ray, 118. My personal reading. Chapter 15. Once back at McGonagall Castle, Harry was finally able to tell his guardians about the details of the events of the World Cup. He was hesitant to speak about the threat, but he knew that they would want to know. Both were angry and worried, but knew that the only thing they could really do was warn him to be careful. Harry fidgeted. The thing is, I recognise the voice. Mr Malfoy has a very distinctive drawl. Another blanched. You're certain? She asked seriously. Harry nodded. I definitely knew his voice. He stated positively. Amelia sighed, collapsing into a chair. I will tell Amelia. But I'm sure you realise that there isn't anything that can be done about it at this time. Harry nodded. As long as he has the minister in his pocket, Malfoy will always escape justice. But Amelia can watch him. If he sets one toe out of line, she'll be there. The days to the Wizengamot meeting dwindled, and Amelia spent a great deal of time at McGonagall Castle with Augusta, Minerva and Sirius, going over their plan. Sirius and Remus continued their lessons with Harry and his friends, including the Weasley twins. Both marauders praised the soon-to-be third, fourth, and sixth years on their progress. Remus told them that they were all very advanced for their ages, and would notice the improvement very quickly once returning to the school. In addition to the lessons, Harry made sure to spend a good deal of time just relaxing and having fun. He and his friends would spend at least an hour every day flying, and more time just talking. Harry, Ron and Hermione had been friends for three years already, but Neville, Susan and Ginny hadn't known them that well, apart from Ginny and Ron, of course. So they were enjoying getting to know their new friends. The trio had expanded readily enough into a group of six, and to Harry, the addition of Neville, Susan and Ginny was both welcome and unquestionable. Even though they were new, they all fit quite completely into the circle. Harry truly enjoyed having so many friends, and he hoped that they would continue to have the same dynamic once back at Hogwarts. On August 29th, the nervous Harry watched as Minerva and Sirius prepared to depart. Sirius looked every bit the Lord Black, thanks to the Goblin Glamour Bracelet. He had been able to go out and buy some formal robes as Minerva had only gotten him a few casual ones when she had taken Harry clothes shopping. Don't worry, Pop, he reassured his godson. We've planned and planned. There's no way this goes wrong. Harry didn't look all that reassured. But what if Fudge... If Fudge tries anything, he'll have to go through me. Amelia Bones had appeared, ready to escort the escaped fugitive to the trial of the century. He would wait outside, disguised with his glamour bracelet, until the moment came for him to enter. He would only do so once Amelia had played his memories to cast the seed of doubt on his guilt. Oddly enough, Amelia's statement did seem to get through to Harry, and he gave his godfather a huge hug. Promise me you'll come back, he whispered, trying not to cry. Minerva was going as well, because she wanted to see what happened and also because she was seen as a staple in the wizarding world, much like Augusta. As old as the McGonagall family was, they did not have a seat on the Wizengamot, so the best she could do was sit in the audience to offer her support. Once he was alone, Harry felt the silence closing in, as all he could think about was what Fudge might do to cover up the Ministry's mistake. He was surprised when, not two minutes later, the flu flared to life again, and Ginny stepped out. She ran over to hug Harry. Are you alright? She asked worriedly, sitting back on the couch next to him, and running a critical eye over his hunched frame. Harry shrugged. I'm just... scared, he admitted, before looking up in confusion. How did you know? Ginny shrugged, looking uncertain herself. I don't know, she admitted. I just felt like you needed me. That was definitely requires some thought later, 
but for now, Harry just wanted to talk. So he and Ginny settled back and spent the rest of the morning enjoying each other's company. Harry told her about his Green God's visit, and her jaw almost hit the floor when she learned not only how rich he was, but that he was also the heir to Gryffindor. Harry looked worried when he told her, but she just shook her head, swallowing. You know this doesn't change anything, Potter, she admonished. You'll always be just Harry to me. Harry looked like Ron would have had the cannons just won the World Cup. Ginny mentally gave herself a pat on the back, and the two continued talking as if nothing had happened. The first question she had was what being an heir to the notable founder entailed. Harry shrugged. I'm not sure, he admitted. Shopshot didn't say anything, but maybe he doesn't know. I might have to wait until I get back to the school, or maybe find something in the Gryffindor's vault. We didn't have time to visit a few days ago, so Sirius said it would probably have to wait until next summer. Ginny nodded, content with what little information Harry had parted with, which was pretty much all he knew himself. And they moved the conversation on to other topics. Anything that would take Harry's mind off the trial that even now was unfolding. Lords and ladies of the Wizengamot, I would like to call to order this meeting on August the 29th of this year, 1994. Albus Dumbledore banged the gavel and the murmur of conversation tapered off. He looked around the room and smiled. The witness section was mostly empty, as usual though he was surprised to see his Transfiguration professor sitting there. Even if she had just come to observe the session, she should be sitting with the rest of the audience, in the section designated for observers, not witnesses. His note to her had received a rather short reply that had him wondering if she was upset with him. The conversation with Molly had had much the same result, and he had left with fewer answers than he had come with. She seemed to be giving him a look that he usually only saw when she was arguing with Severus about his liberal deductions of Gryffindor points. Now, before we begin with our agenda for the day, does anyone have anything they would like to add? It was customary to ask, but he didn't expect anyone to actually respond. Which was why he was surprised when Amelia stood up. Chief Warlock, I have an addendum to add to the agenda. Dumbledore nodded for the head of the DMLE to continue, which he did after handing a few vials to the aide, whose job it was to handle any documents or evidence required for each meeting. With a glance towards the long bottom seat, Amelia continued, Ladies and gentlemen, I have come forward today to right a grievous wrong. Almost 13 years ago, our world was in turmoil. We all did things we weren't proud of, but we needed to regain order. But that does not mean that the law can be ignored. I have just entered four memories into evidence. I have certified them myself as being completely true and unaltered. I ask that you watch them before I say anything else. Dumbledore had a bad feeling about this, but there was little he could do, as the entire chamber watched the replay of first the Potter's conversation with Sirius, where they agreed to switch secret keepers. Next, of Sirius finding his friends too late to help. There were tears in many of the crowd at the obvious pain the young man felt, seeing his brother in all but blood lying glassy-eyed on the ground. And finally, of Sirius's confrontation with Peter. The fourth memory was from Harry, and showed his meeting with Black the previous June up to and including Fudge's refusal to believe them, and ordering Sirius to be kissed immediately. There was a general outcry in the chamber, as some began calling for a trial. Others tried to claim it was fabricated, and still others wanted to know why Amelia had these memories. Finally, Madame Longbottom stood up, drawing at the attention of the room. After all, when Augusta Longbottom spoke, people listened. Wizards and witches, what is the matter with you? Many of us were seated on this body 13 years ago, and yet we all sat back and did nothing, as an innocent man was condemned to Azkaban without a trial. And now that we have the ability to act, 
We have the responsibility to act. Amelia smiled as the formidable woman quoted a then 13-year-old boy's words to a body of lords and ladies. First on our list should be to give the Lord Black the trial he should have received 13 years ago, followed by some very sincere grovelling to hopefully prevent him from taking his ire out on us. Sergeant looked caught between a rock and a hard place. He gulped, knowing that his refusal to act several months ago would have come back to bite him in the arse now, as he turned to Amelia. With so many witnesses, he did the only thing he could. I assume you can contact Mr. Black? We will certainly do our best to set up a trial, as soon as he turns himself in. Amelia's smile was rather predatory. She had not missed his claim to do his best to set up a trial. No need, Minister, she informed him, shooting a look at Minerva, who immediately stood up and made her way out of the room. The Transfiguration Professor left for a few seconds, returning quite quickly with a healthy and very proper-looking serious Black. There were even more cries in the gallery at this, and a few people reached for their wands, but Amelia was quicker. She cast a shield spell around the man, and her voice reached all corners of the room as she spoke. Anyone who hexes Mr. Black will see that spell returned, and themselves are sitting down right beside him on the floor. She warned as Minerva led the younger man to the seat at the front. The chains immediately trapped the young lord, but he didn't look at all concerned. He was playing the part of a lord quite well, and many were surprised at how different he seemed from the posters that had appeared after his escape from Azkaban. Amelia nodded to the aura she had tapped for this assignment. Kingsley Shacklebolt was a steady presence, always calm and collected, and very good at what he did. Nymphadora Tonks, on the other hand, she picked more for her potential, and because, out of all of her auras, Tonks was the only one who really deserved to be there. She deserved to know that her mother's cousin was innocent. Those two were some of the few auras she knew to be completely trustworthy. She had been very careful to not let word of what she was planning on doing out this morning. She knew there were some people in her department who would happily run to Fudge or Dumbledore and tip them off. Tonks and Shacklebolt had much the same view as she did, and their first instincts were always to do what was right, no matter what anyone else thought. Tonks gave Sirius a bright grin, trying to tell him that she believed him, which he immediately understood, if the answering smile and wink was any indication. She had been very small when they had last seen each other, but he was pleased that she remembered him. Kingsley was the one to administer the Veritas Serum, putting three drops on his tongue before stepping back. Amelia leaned forward, giving the potion a few moments to set in, before she began asking questions. What is your name? Sirius Orion Black, he replied in a monotone. Amelia nodded. Who was the Potter's secret keeper? Peter Battergrew. There was some muttering, but a look from Augusta silenced them. Why did you switch? We thought I would be the obvious choice. Voldemort, there were some flinches there, would come after me, but I wouldn't be able to give him anything and Peter would be safe, because no one would suspect that we would use him. What happened on November the 1st, 1981? I was angry and scared and beyond rational thought. I dragged Peter down to a muggle street, where he set me up by shouting for everyone to hear how I had betrayed Lily and James. He then cut off his own finger and transformed into his rat form, escaping into the sewer. What do you mean, his rat form? He is an unregistered animagus. Peter's form is a rat. Amelia nodded at Kingsley, who immediately gave Sirius the antidote. She then turned to Dumbledore, who had no choice but to go along with this. He sighed silently and turned to the council. All those in favour of convicting the accused? Not even the former, or imperious according to Fudge, Death Eaters had the guts to raise their hands. Next to Fudge, a rather short, squat witch wearing a pink cardigan 
and a horrendous bow in her hair, started to raise her hand, but stopped with a nudge and the slight shake of the head from Fudge. Dumbledore nodded. All those in favour of clearing the accused of all charges. The vote was unanimous. There was even some clapping as the chains dropped away, and Sirius stood up grinning. Thank you, lords and ladies, he said graciously. His gaze focused on Dumbledore, even though he spoke to the room. I am so pleased to see justice upheld. I am sure we can discuss the proper compensation for my unlawful imprisonment at a later date. His eyes focused on Fudge on that comment. For now, I would like to officially claim my family seat. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Unfortunately, Sirius, you will need to claim your lordship first. Sirius just raised his hand, where the black head of House Ring was predominantly displayed. The goblins have already acknowledged my lordship. So, I ask again, may I officially claim my family suit? Dumbledore nodded, defeated. And the room fell into silence, waiting as Sirius made his way to his family seat, where he winked at Amelia to tell her he was game for what would come next. He didn't sit down, which told everyone he had something else to say. His statement rocked the entire body. My first order of business is to take over as the regent for the Potter family seat on behalf of my godson, Harry James Potter. Dumbledore was the very first one to make sure his voice was heard. I am sorry, Sirius, but you need to have the consent of the official guardian in order to act as regent. Harry is currently being cared for by his mother's sister. Sirius glanced at Minerva, who stood up and handed the copies of the change of guardianship form she had brought with her in preparation to Amelia. Turning around to face the shocked and confused body of witches and wizards, she explained, I took over the guardianship for Mr. Potter at the beginning of the summer, after his current ones were deemed unsuitable. Vernon Dursley is currently serving time in prison for embezzlement and theft, and his wife and son have fled the country. The guardianship forms have already been filed and made official, and have been amended to include Lord Black as a secondary guardian. As Mr. Potter's primary guardian, I have approved his appointment to region of the Potter family seat. Dumbledore was once more feeling flabbergasted. He had well and truly been outmaneuvered, and by someone he had thought to be completely loyal to him. No wonder the wards had failed. He could only hope that their actions didn't spell the end of the wizarding world. He nodded, defeated, and was thankful when they moved on to the scheduled topics to be covered. Several reporters from the Daily Prophet got their career-making scoops by attending the boring, standard, run-of-the-mill Wizencomot meeting that day. Amelia waited until the meeting was over, before she followed the Chief Warlock out of the courtroom. Albus! Dumbledore turned, and almost grimaced, but hid his eye behind the customary twinkling eyes. How can I be of service, Amelia? he asked graciously. Amelia was not swayed by his attitude, however, and she simply set herself so that her balance was centred, ready to act should the need arise. During my investigation into Lord Black's incarceration, I was most intrigued to be presented with irrefutable proof that he did not, in fact, betray Lord and Lady Potter to Voldemort. You'll understand my confusion when the item could have exonerated him was sealed shortly after Lord and Lady Potter's deaths. By you. Dumbledore once more had to force himself to remain calm. I am not certain that I know what you are speaking of, Madam Bones. There was a definite bite to his words, but Amelia was just getting started. Had you not sealed the Potter will, Lord Black would not have been sent to Azkaban for twelve years without a trial. The bequests would have clearly shown that he was not the secret keeper. Perhaps you could explain to me why you felt it necessary to seal the will, and completely ignore its contents when placing the young Potter heir with guardians, specifically not included among the possible caregivers when there were, at the time, three sets of guardians on that list who could have cared for him. 
Dumbledore reached out slightly with a ledger loan entry. Somehow not surprised when he was rebuffed immediately. But of course the head of the DMLE would have training. He doubted he would be able to get through, even with a full powered attack, which would surely see him arrested. As it was, he did catch the narrowing of her eyes, and concluded she must have felt him probe her. He decided it would not be pragmatic for him to further test his luck, and simply sighed. I did not want unsavoury characters to try and gain access to young Harry's inheritance. As for his placement, his mother's sister seemed the most logical place for him. Mrs. Potter raised an ancient protection by sacrificing herself for her son, and, inadvertently or not, made it possible for blood protections to be raised. As long as he could call the place where his mother's family dwelt home, there is nothing higher than family, after all. Amelia snorted. You'll have to ask Lily about that, when you meet her again. Petunia Dursley hates magic, and has ever since Lily began her schooling. Anyone who knew Lily at all knew that. As for your explanation, good luck trying to appease Minerva. She is quite put out that she could have had 13 more years with the boy she already thinks of as a grandson. And good luck trying to insert yourself into Harry's life in any way. Minerva's not the only one put out with you. You'll have a lot of work to do to convince Harry to trust you again. I doubt that will ever happen, after what you've done. Amelia left him with that thought, and Dumbledore, remembering the look his Transfiguration Professor had given him during the trial, believed that she was right. Minerva was most definitely angry with him. He wondered how much Harry knew, but he doubted Amelia's views were completely accurate. Harry was still just a boy after all, and Dumbledore had been the one to offer him a place of belonging. At Hogwarts, after so many years of being unworthy at his relatives, Dumbledore had offered him a chance to shine. The wrinkles with Harry would be easier to smooth over, as the headmaster knew the boy had begun to think of him as something of a grandfather. No, Harry wasn't the one he had to work on. Minerva and Sirius, however, would be more difficult to sway. They wouldn't understand that it had all been for the greater good. He had to do what was necessary. The next morning's edition of the Daily Prophet was filled with Sirius's illegal incarceration, his trial, subsequent freedom, the hundred thousand galleons the Ministry was giving him for the wrongful imprisonment, and Harry's change of guardianship. Harry was just glad to have his godfather be able to see him off to Hogwarts without having to wear a glamour. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm sorry if there's a drop in quality right now. I have got a nasty cold. I've only just started recovering from it. So if there are blips, it's probably because I had to cough or sneeze rather badly. My throat's only just stopped hurting for crying out loud. But yes, I do love this chapter. I love the trial. And Amelia just not taking bullshit and not falling for the charming act. I love that. He may be a venerable old man, but he's very misguided in some things. And I just love that Harry wants to be seen off by Sirius. What can he do? Poor boy deserves it. Anyway, you guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, guys and albino pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.